I'm Donnie Deutsch. And I'm Mark Halpern. And with all due respect to what Donald Trump is, let's not forget all the things he's not. He's not a groper. He's not Hitler. He isn't a bully. He's not a phony politician. He's not a fan of teleprompters. He's not a Democrat. He's not a member of the political class. He's not a Republican. He's not a conservative. And I'm not a politician. I'm not a debater. I'm not the president right now. I am not a fast trigger. I'm not a masochist. I'm not a bad person. I'm not passive at all. I'm not a bully. No, I'm not a bully at all. I'm not a shrinker of economies. I'm not against any religion. I'm not thin-skinned. I'm not a hateful person. I'm not an angry person. I'm not an Obama person. I'm not a conspiracy person. I'm not a fan of Bernie. I'm not a cutter. You I'm mean? not an isolationist. I am not an extremist. I'm not stupid, okay? I can tell you that. This show is not going to start with news that Donald Trump has released the names of people he consider for the Supreme Court. And that's not because we don't think it's a big story. We do. We'll be discussing Trump's perspective picks later in the program at some length. But first, as testament to just how bad that bad blood between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders has gotten, we're leading with some good old-fashioned Democratic discord. This is now arguably one of the low points in relations between Team Hillary and Team Bernie. Her team has been trying to tamp down the intra-party squabble that started in Nevada this weekend when Bernie Sanders supporters say they were mistreated by party leadership. After pouring some fuel on that fire with a strongly worded statement yesterday, Sanders made it clear in a speech last night in Carson, California, as Clinton was narrowly winning the Kentucky primary, Sanders was taking Oregon, that he has no plans to go away quietly. The Democratic Party is going to have to make a very, very profound and important decision. It can do the right thing and open its doors and welcome into the party people who are prepared to fight for real economic and social change. Sanders campaign manager Jeff Weaver continued to criticize the Democratic Party, specifically DNC chair Debbie Wasserman Schultz on TV this morning. Donnie, you know it's a bad day for Democrats when the headlines about this fight include words like chaos and tensions explode. You know, so how big is Hillary's Bernie problem now? Huge, huge. You know, you got always be closing up there, and you're st Hillary is starting to not feel like a closer. The woman whose big uh, success to date is beating Rick Lazio in an election. She's playing in a different game here. Let's think about the last 24 hours. Donald Trump went on Megyn Kelly, very presidential last night, a Barbara Walters type interview with his old adversary. They made nice, there was no headlines. Today he comes out very presidentially, particularly if you're a Republican, very credible list of uh, Supreme Court justice candidates. And at the same time, Hillary cannot put Bernie away. More than anything, if I'm going to give the headline of today, one candidate looks like a winner and the other doesn't in that simple terms. The other problem you also have is the continuing message of Bernie is the same message of Trump. The system's rigged against you and Hillary is the system. So as long as Bernie's around, he's doing Trump's dirty work. He doesn't even have to go after Hillary. So right now, this is a, a bad moment in time snapshot for Hillary. It is. There's no doubt. You know, Jeff Weaver told us here last night, they're going to the convention to fight to try to win the nomination, to try to affect the platform, to try to change the rules of the Democratic Party, to fight against what they think is bad about the Democratic brand. They're not going to the convention to unify. And after last night and after the fight over the weekend, that's not going to change. The other thing I think that's a big problem, and this goes to image and brand for her versus Trump, she, well, you want to be a happy warrior, but that's not just happy. It's also warrior. She can't put away Bernie Sanders. That's not somebody who looks like a warrior while she's having trouble now with Trump and some of these state and national polls. And the scary thing about Sanders is he's 74 years old. He's an angry old man. I don't mean it to be ageist. You approach things very differently at that stage. You know, we would probably have Ted Cruz still around if Ted Cruz was 70 years old. He's got a future. And when you're older and you're not worried about the next race, and when you're older, you, you're... You just don't give a crap about anything anymore. And even when he does technically lose the nomination, you just wonder, what is this angry old man going to be doing? Yeah, and her support, his supporters, they don't look at the Clintons as a good second choice. No. They look at the Clintons as a part of the Democratic Party they don't care about. She can smooth this out, but after last night, a lot tougher. Okay, just in case infighting wasn't enough bad news for Hillary Clinton, in the past 24 hours, Democratic frontrunner woke up this morning to some troubling headlines today. According, this is incredible. According to a new WBUR poll, Clinton is neck and neck with Trump in a Granite State general election matchup. She's up 44 to 42 in the general election swing state. That's a much closer race 
than a hypothetical matchup between Trump and Bernie Sanders. In that head-to-head, -head, Sanders leads by double digits, 54% to 38%. What explains this? Well, there are three big things that we found fascinating. Number one, a high percentage of men still don't really like Clinton. In these matchups, Trump beats Clinton among men while essentially tying with Sanders with the fellas. Number two, and we found this one really surprising, Trump beats both Clinton and Sanders among young New Hampshire voters ages 18 to 29. 18 to 29. Finally, independents favored Bernie Sanders over Donald Trump in a hypothetical November matchup, but these voters don't seem to shift to Clinton if she is the Democratic nominee. Take a look at these numbers. Sanders beats Trump among independents by nearly 20 points, but Clinton loses 48% to 34%. Mark, New Hampshire's only got four electoral, electoral <laughs> votes. It's got a very hot Senate race. And you basically have independents going in one direction, purely Trump. And the numbers we talked about before we come in the air, that just about 80% of young voters give Hillary a highly unfavorable wow. You never want to overreact to one poll. It is a state with only four electoral votes. But, but this is a state that has seen Clinton and Trump up close over a long period of time. The fact that she's doing so poorly with young people, the fact that Trump is tied with her there now, doesn't mean she won't win New Hampshire. But I can't imagine a worse thing. And there are plenty of New Hampshire for her, and symbolically. And there are plenty of New Hampshire Democrats who are worried now about Trump's appeal to independents in particular in that state. Here's the scary thing right now for Hillary, because obviously things are just feeling shaky right now, but it's only May. It's very hard to move her. We talked about this last time, on. She's baked in. Her big issue is she's untrustworthy and not very likely. You're not going to move that. Whereas Trump, his big issue is temperament. You can move that. And so the scary part is the numbers are not lining up strong with her in this sometimes swing state. But if I've got to move the handles on each of these, hers is a much, much tougher foosball handle to maneuver. And Trump's people I totally agree with that. And the Clinton people claim they don't. I wonder if they secretly do agree with it. I mean, 80% of young people have an unfavorable view of her. That is just even, even if the poll's 20 points off as a snapshot of where she is. I mean, that is, that is mind-boggling. If you think about the popularity of the previous Democratic nominee, yeah. Barack Obama with young people, you know, she's going to have to ask herself some fundamental questions. She's had to do it vis-a-vis -vis Sanders the whole way along. But to, to be losing to Donald Trump amongst young people in New Hampshire, again, I, can almost, I can't imagine a single poll result that I would find more cautionary if I were them. The only one is the independents. The fact that yeah. the independents, they switch from Sanders and they go right over to Trump, which is stunning, whereas the only thing that those two guys have in common is that they are not the status quo, and they are angry, yeah. and they are getting their constituents riled up. But, you know, policy-wise, they don't line up anywhere, so it's incredible. Yeah. One poll, but not an insignificant one. All right, up next, we'll talk about that list of potential Supreme Court justices that Donald Trump put out today after these words from our sponsors. Welcome back. 11 names are on Donald J. Trump's list of people he would consider to fill the currently empty Supreme Court seat that was held by the late Antonin Scalia. The presumptive Republican nominee today released his picks. Includes three women, eight men. More than half are from Midwestern states, including battleground states like Wisconsin, Michigan, and Iowa. Trump put out those names to mollify conservatives who are concerned about the billionaire's constitutionalist credentials. So, Donnie, how do you do with this list? Well, Heritage Foundation is going to be very happy right off, pretty much off their website. Look, he, he was very presidential, particularly Republican presidential, put a list together that nobody can argue with, that maybe left off Mike Lee um, as far as Pryor. But they included Mike Lee's the, the brother. brother uh, Sykes and Pryor, obviously candidates that the far right are going to be very, very happy about. The interesting thing beyond the appointees is all Trump has to do now is act typical and it's a win for him. He did something that basically a political science student could do today, put that list together, right. and Trump's acting presidential. This is an issue that the right cares a lot about, and for a lot of people who are worried about Trump, if, he, if, he, if they're mollified by this, and he's promised to do this list for a while, if they're mollified, if they say, okay, if Trump actually picks from this list, that's enough. They can get over all their other reservations because the, the, the battle cry will be, you may have reservations about Trump, but do you want to give up a co-equal branch for a generation, which if the next president gets three or four appointments, you might be doing if you vote for Hillary Clinton or you don't vote for Trump. I threw out devil's advocate to you when we were talking before the show saying, look, conservatives, maybe a few less will turn out. They're never voting for Hillary. So strategically, 
why not go a little bit more moderate? Then you're going to pick up so many of those swing voters. But he just had he had to wave this flag. This is a flag you got to wave for a certain type of voter, and 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 make the convention united. The delegates will like this list. It's been denounced already by Nan Aaron, one of the leading liberal voices in judicial battles going Which back. Is a win for confirmation battles, a good win for him, and it also speaks to. Again, for, for a certain type of Republican, a certain type of conservative, speaks to a bedrock principle which, about constitutionalism. So I think it's a smart list for Trump politically, and he'll take some heat. But in the left-right world, that's the kind of heat you take. Very Republican presidential. Yep, okay, exactly. we have to be honest. We've lost count of all the things that Donald Trump has said about foreign policy. It would have probably torpedoed any other normal presidential campaign. He called NATO obsolete. He praised Russia's strongman Vladimir Putin. He's essentially threatened a trade war with China and announced an America First message that questions U.S. funding and military support around the globe. The presumptive Republican nominee added another page to his atypical Trump doctrine again with an interview published yesterday in which he told Reuters that he would be happy to open up talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong about the communist country's nuclear program. In New York Times Magazine cover story posted today, Trump also told reporter Robert Draper he's never been to Iraq and jokingly said that the most threatening place he's ever been was Brooklyn, New York. I get offended by that. And then mentioned cities around the United States, like Oakland, California, and Ferguson, Missouri, that Trump called, quote, among the most dangerous in the world. Today, Trump is trying to brandish his global affairs cred by holding a meeting with former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger. Mark, are any of these a risk for Trump? Or in some ways, do most of them play into, we, we need a banshee in there. We need new math. We need, uh, we need new rules. I mean, Americans are not happy with the way things are going overseas. And I know all the Clinton uh, fans are going to look at us saying this and say, this is irresponsible. You can't possibly be saying Trump knows what he's doing. I've talked to Trump about NATO. I've talked about some of his more provocative positions. Some of them are kind of fast and loose. Some of them are not only thoughtful, but I think in line with the American people. And in the case of NATO, I think perfectly reasonable policy positions to take. This is a guy who's doing a lot of what Barack Obama did. You know, we talked about this on Morning Joe this morning. Barack Obama said he'd meet with foreign leaders, and Hillary Clinton said the same thing, irresponsible. That's, that's a different style of leadership for a time when voters are looking for something different. I think the wackiest of the wacky was, was, the, was, was frankly, uh, how I'm yeah. Don't John, don't worry. Just, I'm leaving. That's it, the last day I'm here. Um, My phone acting. Um, is basically, you know, arming Japan and, and South Korea with nukes. I mean, I think that, to me, was kind of, yeah. huh, what? But, you know, look, he is that Nicholson character. You want me on that wall. You need me on that wall. You may not like to talk about me at those dinner parties or think about me. But ironically, also, part of his women problem can be solved with some smart foreign policy, some very aggressive yeah. policy, the security moms. So I think he's going to start to chip away at his woman issue with very strong, very aggressive perhaps some also even credible old school thinking, but in a weird way, those two things work together. I agree with you. He said some things that will cause pause. I think in the daily back and forth, there's so much going on, it won't matter. If he says something that is just deemed completely out of bounds in the debates on foreign policy, I think that could be a big problem. Out of bounds versus ignorant. When Ben Carson said that China yeah. is involved in this serious thing. So there's a difference between people expect him to be out of bounds. Yeah. If he does a Sarah Palin, yeah, you know, I, I see Washer yeah. from my, from yeah. my window. That's when you yes. go, wait yes. a second. If he says something that, that suggests he's not up to be commander in chief, and I agree with you, ignorance more than yes. wacky, wacky or, or new, new, just kind of stylized and new. All right. There was plenty of buildup to what turned out to be a relatively tame interview between Donald Trump and Megyn Kelly on Fox Broadcast Network last night. But CBS's Nora O'Donnell quickly stole the spotlight this morning. And the Tiffany Network aired her conversation with Trump's daughter, Ivanka, who was asked about that New York Times weekend story detailing her father's behavior with women. I found it to be pretty disturbing based on the facts as I know them. And obviously, I very much know them, both in the capacity as a daughter and um, in the capacity as an executive who's worked alongside of him. I'm not in every interaction my father has, but he's not a groper. Mm -hmm. It's not who he is. And, and I've known my father, obviously, my whole life. And he has total respect for women. When I think about myself as a feminist, it's important that women are treated equally. And he treats women and men equally. The polls show he has a 69% unfavorable rating among women. How does he change that? You would have to ask him. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, he's, he's running his campaign. I think that people are just starting to see who he is. The race is different now. And I think that people will be able to see the softer side of him. 
So, Donnie, you and I have talked about Ivanka. It's not the most original statement to make, but people who know her are, are impressed by her. All three of his oldest kids have been out campaigning, less than some might, thought they might. How big an asset do you think she's going to be the rest of the way? I lived in a building with Ivanka for several years. And she is, and I'm going to say this as a 58-year-old man, one of the most impressive human beings, not young women, impressive human beings I've ever met in my life. Bright, poised, self-deprecating, um, in charge, elegant. 360 degree awareness of what's going on. Uh, 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 and you know, here's where this works for Trump. Number one, he's her dad. He, along with Ivanka, made her. He has three great kids. I know the other kids also. And I said this on Morning Joe the other day, and whereas in certain ways Trump is a feminist in the most important way. He has promoted women before anybody did in the construction business. And yes, he says some boorish things and whatnot, but in a strange way, that's equal opportunity. I'm gonna, I'm gonna promote them equal opportunity and I'm gonna insult just like I insult men. So I'm not condoning it, but in the most important way, and she is a stunning, literally and figuratively example of this, we have never seen in our adult life in a offspring in a campaign with the power that this woman will have. I and, really feel And her story. own celebrity. He's got, as you know, five kids. Yes. The three oldest ones are the ones who have been out campaigning. I think that that they will be foolish if they do not put her front and center at the convention. I, you know, people are talking now about Trump speaking every night. I'd have her speak every night at the convention. She is a, a national brand uh, who is who is the best validator her dad could possibly have. And as I said, she's got a 360 degree understanding of the world and of people and of this race. And if I'm Donald Trump, I stand up and say, this could be a future president of the United States, my daughter, and that'll even be a better Trump president, the new Bushes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, up next, it's interesting. Up next, we'll talk Democratic Congressman Tim Ryan, more about the hubbub in his party right after this quick break. Don't Donnie thought his own idea was interesting. Nobody else ever does. <laughs> Joining us now from the Cannon Rotunda on Capitol Hill, the Honorable Democratic Congressman from the 13th District, the Buckeye State, Tim Ryan, a Clinton supporter and, of course, a superdelegate. Congressman, thanks for coming back on the show. Thanks for having me. If uh, Bernie Sanders called you and said, Congressman, should I drop out of the race now or should I stay in and fight all the way through Philadelphia, what would you say? <laughs> I'd say stay in until June. Give everybody who's campaigned for you an opportunity to vote for you, people in California and whatnot. They've worked hard, they're energetic, and I'd say give them a shot to vote for you, but then, you know, let's bear down and, and start focusing on Donald Trump. Congressman, let's assume he's going to go uh, after that point, I don't want to say quietly into the night, but step to the side. What does Hillary need to give him to really get him on board with the campaign? What, what, what is going to make satiate him other than the nomination? Uh, I don't know. I mean, you'd have to ask, ask Bernie Sanders and ask uh, his crew. But I think watching Donald Trump over the past few days, I hope, uh, clears everybody's eyes up to see exactly what we're dealing with, exactly how dangerous he is, and, and not just for our domestic economy, but for the globe. I mean, you're talking about North Korea. You're talking about dismantling NATO. I mean, we, we have enough fires in the world. We don't need a president of the United States starting more. We need a president that's putting out fires. And, and Trump continues to start these fires, and I think that's going to help us as Democrats really be able to uh, unite the party. And I think that's going to happen, hopefully, as soon as these uh, elections are over in June. Congressman, which of these is closer to true? Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders basically agree on most major issues, or Bernie Sanders is too liberal to get elected president of the United States? I think they agree on the principles of uh, the issues of the day. There's no question about it. And, and the question is, what direction do we want to move into uh, in the next few years? We got tremendous challenges. And I think both Hillary and Bernie and the Democratic philosophy uh, today, especially compared to Trump, are getting us ready for the, for the new economy. I mean, look. If you look at 40% of net new jobs, they're, being, uh, they're coming from startups. The top 1% of startups are creating most net new jobs. So we have an agenda. Hillary Clinton for sure has an agenda uh, of how we're going to get those jobs well, going. If you're if looking I, on, I'm sorry, Congressman, yeah. maybe, maybe ask you this way. Is Bernie Sanders more liberal than Hillary Clinton? Uh, I, of course. I don't think he's a socialist. <laughs> of course he is. So she agrees with mo on, on Bernie Sanders, a socialist, on most major issues? 
I said on principles, on the fact right. that you are, you know, your intentions of utilizing government on behalf of working class families, making college more affordable, right. making investments into the economy. Of course, um, on those principles, they agree. But uh, there's no question that a socialist is more liberal than a so, progressive so Democrat. I just ask one, one more to, to flesh this out. What's something of a specific position he has that you'd say is socialist where she's not as liberal? Well, I, I think you could take the, the college plan. There's a big difference between free college and debt-free college. Part of the uh, issue is making sure we're able to control costs. And Hillary Clinton has a plan where we're asking young people to have the opportunity for work-study programs. We're making sure that they're going to walk out of college debt-free, but they may have to pay a little bit uh, along the way. But they're going to have an opportunity to do that. And if you look at what she'll uh, provide for young people coming out of college, ability to start a business, entrepreneurship, she provides a lot of these opportunities, uh, Mark, that are going to grow the economy for the millennials. And that's the key. Who's going to grow the economy? I think she runs circles around Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump when it comes to the main issue of the day, and that's yep. the economics, who's going to grow the economy, who understands the new economy, and who understands what millennials need for the new economy, portable pensions, portable yep. well, health I just want to jump in for a second, Con retraining. Congressman. It's Donnie. We're talking about the millennials. We just saw some very troubling numbers yesterday with the millennials that she's got had an 80 percent unfavorability in New Hampshire. So why are young people not only not flocking to Bernie, but just ostensibly just shunning her. Well, I think a lot of it is they don't quite understand yet what Hillary wants to do. And I think once we communicate that, once they come together after the primary, um, by leaps and bounds, she's running circles around Donald Trump with millennials uh, going into the fall. But they're going to hear about her plans for growing the economy. And I think that is the number one issue, whether you're talking about millennials or you're talking about steelworkers in Ohio. How do we bring back manufacturing? How do we get these kids jived up? What's America 2.0, Donnie? What's America 3.0? That's what Hillary Clinton is promoting uh, for all of us and especially for the millennials. And you have to work with the government. You can't can't have these blustery uh, statements. You got to have a real plan. You know, I mean, in Ohio, I played a lot of football growing up. I had a lot of coaches come in before the game. They would throw garbage cans in the locker room, give a big rah-rah speech. But if you don't have a plan when you get out onto the football field, you're going to lose. And Donald Trump is throwing garbage cans in the locker room. Hillary Clinton has the plans ready to be executed that are going to help millennials and help us grow the economy. And that's the bottom line, and that's going to be the big difference in this election. Okay. Congressman Ryan, thank you very much. Always great to talk to you. Coming up, a deeper dive into that Donald Trump shortish list of SCOTUS picks. Who did he choose, and what messages does he hope to send with the names? We'll explore all that when we come back right after this. As we mentioned earlier, Donald Trump released the names of 11 people he says he'd consider for the Supreme Court. Here to discuss whether his picks will be enough to pacify nervous conservatives is NBC News Justice correspondent Pete Williams. Joins us from Washington and makes his debut on this program, which has us overjoyed. Pete, thank you for joining us here. <laughs> you um, have a very low overjoy threshold. No, this is an honor for us. <laughs> um, so 11 names, uh, which ones jump out at you as symbolically important or interesting to think about what signals they send? Well, he's already said, Donald Trump, that he'd consider two of the names on the list. Appeals Court Judges William Pryor of Alabama and Diane Sykes of Wisconsin. Like the other four federal judges on this list, they were put on the bench by President George W. Bush. Judge Sykes was once married. Uh, this is a little unusual here. Judge Sykes was once married to Milwaukee talk show host Charlie Sykes, who supported Ted Cruz. Pryor is among the most conservative on the list. Uh, the other five are state Supreme Court justices, including Thomas Lee of Utah. He's the brother of Utah Republican Senator Mike Lee, who was Ted Cruz's biggest Senate supporter, both the sons of former Solicitor General Rex Lee, who served in the Reagan administration. So it's a pretty blue chip list of the names I know and as I've read about them. It seems like th these are all, they're all names of people who conservatives can look at and get the exact signal Trump wants to send, right? These are strict constructionalists who could be, who could be seen as in the mold of a Scalia in terms of judicial philosophy, right? 
Yes, and I suppose the Trump people will be pleased by the response they're getting. Uh, the conservative groups are saying, well, it's a good list. Can we trust Trump to stick with it? But that's sort of an endorsement of the list. And then the liberal groups are saying this is a terrible list, which I assume is going to be pleasing <laughs> to the Trump people. But I suspect it's intended to do two things. Appeal to conservatives who would find it to be satisfactory. They're all, they're all sound, respected conservative. And perhaps reassure others in the party because none of these people on the list are, are so far out that they're beyond the conservative mainstream. Pete, are there any names that don't appear on the list and jump out at you? Yeah, that's the surprising thing to me, because uh, there are several names that you would think would be on any Republican's list. Paul Clement, the former solicitor general under George W. Bush, now in private practice, one of the most prominent Supreme Court litigators. He argued the Hobby Lobby case. He represented the House Republicans who were opposed to same-sex marriage. Brett Kavanaugh of the D.C. Circuit, a former uh, clerk to Justice Anthony Kennedy, former deputy to Ken Starr during the Clinton investigation in the White House Counsel's Office under George W. Bush. Uh, two other appeals court judges, Tom Griffith of the D.C. Circuit and Neil Gorsuch of the Tenth Circuit, who's a former Kennedy clerk. And some of those names, uh, Kavanaugh and I think Clement, were on the Heritage Foundation list that came out earlier this year that Trump's people said they looked at. Yeah. As I look at these, again, the ones I'm familiar with, is there's a range of ages here, but it seems to me that some of the people right. he left off are, are on the younger end of names that people consider. Is that a big issue for conservatives, that, uh, that uh, they want someone, the next Republican president, to nominate younger justices so they can stay on the bench for a longer period of time? Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the people who really work at this, like the Federalist Society, and I would say this is really not a Federalist Society list, or you'd certainly see Clement right. and, and Brett Kavanaugh on it. That's been one of their things, to put younger people, get them nominated to the courts of appeals. Because if you look at the recent Democratic nominees, the Obama nominees, they're all pretty young. Of course, John Roberts was young when he was nominated as well. So that's been the current trend, to try to get younger justices on so that they can serve longer. Uh, i, I got to say one other thing about one surprising name on this list. Don Willett, who is uh, one of the state Supreme Court justices on the list, Maybe he's on because he's a prolific tweeter, and maybe that appeals to the Trump people. But his tweets have pretty much been anti-Trump. He sort of mocks Trump in the tweets and said that he was, you know, he would it would bring tears to your eyes if you could see uh, Trump's list of potential Supreme Court nominees. And now I are one. There's two choices: either they didn't know, or they have a twisted <laughs> sense of humor, one or the other. Mark, <laughs> is there any? You know, it's interesting. Pete mentioned if we can trust him on this list. Yeah. Is this the one area? Was a lot of people feel Trump in his soul as a moderate. We know his kids, and particularly when it comes to uh, women's rights issues, that he's just putting this list out, and once he's president, he's going to do whatever the hell he pleases. Well, that's always been the fear. But more so with this guy than fear, anybody. But, but no one, uh, Pete, check me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember any nominee putting out a list like this. I've heard them talk about which current justices or past justices they like, or maybe one or two names of sitting jur jurists. But I don't remember any nominee putting out a list, and it does go to the the, the, the question of can Trump satisfy people with just a list as opposed to some sort of more ironclad commitment? Well, it's, it's unusual for that reason. And also, you know, we don't know whether any of the people on this list were asked by the Trump campaign if they would be willing right. to be considered, willing to have their names out there publicly. I mean, the downside to having your name on this list is only if, if he does stick with this list, there's only going to be one person chosen. Do you want to be one of the also rands? Uh, I mean, there are lots of odd questions that the list raises, but right. you've mentioned a couple of them. And just to go back to the ones who were left off, you said, I think correctly, that these are a group of sort of mainstream center-right judges and justices and, and, and people who the conservative groups will like. Is there any difference between their judicial philosophy and the people he left off? Are they, for instance, more ma moderate in some way than a Clement or Kavanaugh? Paul Clement's pretty conservative. Brett Kavanaugh is pretty conservative. I can't think of something in their past that would leave them off the list. Right. I'll, I'll contrast that with, say, Jeffrey Sutton, an appeals court judge of the Sixth Circuit, uh, who is widely respected, but uh, perhaps has a stain on his record as a, a, an appeals court judge who thought Obamacare did meet the constitutional test, so right. perhaps that ruled him out. But you see, that's why you would not expect to see him on the list. I don't know why Kavanaugh and Clement wouldn't yep. be on the list. Yep. Well, everybody's going to be gearing up their LexisNexis accounts to figure out if there are decisions here that will be of interest to the left or the right. Pete Williams, thank you. Great to have you on. Hope to have okay. you back My pleasure. a lot. Up next, Harold Ford Jr., Casey Hunt, stop by. We'll talk more about the Democratic Party chaos, the presidential fight, right after this.
It's time for the segment we always call Hunt and Herald. Here with us, MSNBC political correspondent Casey Hunt, who covers the Democratic nomination fight, and the former Democratic congressman, a current Hillary Clinton supporter, Harold Ford Jr. The Pride I love of the Men- name of this Pride segment. Of I didn't, I didn't know that. used it for a long time. Yeah. Um, Are you a supporter you. or a surrogate? And what is the difference? Uh, not much. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so it means both. <laughs> you get the talking points in the email. I don't. I don't. I don't get. I get the talking points, but I sometimes pay attention. Sometimes I don't. He sends them straight to trash. Yeah. Um, so we're talking about Joe Biden said just a little while ago that there is no fundamental split within the Democratic Party, and that he thought Bernie should be able to run his race, but he's confident that if he wins, he'll be that he'll be supportive of Hillary Clinton. Is there, Casey, a fundamental split? I don't think that the split at the end of the day is fundamental. I do think there are a lot of independents who are out there for Bernie Sanders who are not necessarily part of the Democratic Party, and I think you're hearing a lot of noise from them. I do think, you know, there's a segment of them that are getting really upset about process, which in many ways is the opposite of what Bernie Sanders has always said that he stood for. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been yelled at for asking Bernie Sanders a process question, but I I certainly have. We've all had that experience. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So, no, I, I do think we're still at the point where it can be healed. I think Bernie Sanders, over the last 24, 48 hours has increased the rift. Uh, I, I'm not sure yet to what degree, but I think it's worse now than it was 48 hours ago. Can I, can I react to that? First of all, three things. Bernie Sanders, should, there are two things he's got to do. Number one, he has every right to continue in the race if he wants. Um, but if he is serious about what he said the other night, which is he does not want to see Donald Trump be elected, that he'd be damned, I think he said, if he's going to allow a billionaire to represent, try to represent, or pretend to represent, represent the interests of the middle class, then he's got to recognize he doesn't have a shot at winning. Two, he's got, he has some responsibility to calm some of these supporters of his down. I think that there's no doubt, there's no problem with being passionate, but the passion reaches, reaches the point where it has to stop. And finally, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and the Democratic Party, Give him what he wants. If he wants a few more people on a committee, he wants a few more people to be in the room to hammer out the right kind of messaging around income inequality. If he wants a, a group of people to talk about college affordability, let's have that conversation as a party. There's no need to have this kind of rift continue oh. if we can avoid it. And I think a lot of this is avoid- you, you would have negotiated a very different deal yeah, here's, much sooner than here's this. Here's the problem. Bernie Sanders is not Hillary Clinton's problem. Hillary Clinton is Hillary Clinton's problem. Look, you, you, that, it's an interesting head fake to say, but let's say tomorrow he disappears. We just had a congressman on, and this is the problem. When you go to sell Hillary, the only place to go is to sell fear of Trump. And when you come back to Hillary, it's this piece of clay where there's nothing to work with because people don't want experience. They don't trust her. There's nothing in her DNA. There, there is no attribute. You used to talk about brand attributes, okay? There is no attribute in there to sell with other than selling against Trump, and that's the well, problem. I disagree. I think that the attribute of experience and being... But people and I, don't but, want that. That's, but, that's but, a negative. But, but I think there's going to come a point as we get to a one-on-one race where there's going to be some want for that. There's no doubt he... Dis, he cleared out a field of the most qualified Republicans that run in a very long time. But I do think we'll get back to that. And if we don't get back to that, you may be right. She's got a real problem. We sound an awful lot like Jeb Bush supporters six <laughs> months ago. We, we go now a couple weeks without any contest, and everybody's going to focus on California. How is that primary shaping up where Sanders has put in a fair amount of time and has been drawing big crowds where he does? Honestly, I think California could very well turn out to be a bigger story about this race than many people have assumed that it would be because there's been a, a general sense that, hey, this race is over. It's just a matter of her buttoning it up on June 7th. And I know from internal polling on both sides that it's close enough that this could be a race that Bernie Sanders is that an open out. primary or closed primary it's it's an it's a little bit odd for Democrats it's op- it's it's part way open so if you show up at the polls and you're not registered you're registered independent you can register at that point and vote okay. Democrat you can't do that on the Republican side the Republican primary is closed but that's a wild card it's it's a different state than than she's faced or that we've seen a lot of in this in this contest for that reason it's both diverse and it has this potentially open primary so a little bit of a wild card Sanders is going to go camp out there for the next you know, couple of days when I was covering rallies, uh, or a couple of weeks, excuse me, when I was covering rallies in California, I mean, the crowds are astonishing. They're huge. And they were more diverse, honestly, than some of the crowds I'd seen in other states, particularly young Latinos. And unlike in, in uh, where, they, where they were in, uh, yesterday in Kentucky, 
going on television with paid media in California is a major commitment. Yes. Any sign that either of them is going to do that? And if not, what is the campaign about except for rallies and local coverage? They're both, both camps are still weighing exactly how to go up on TV or whether to go up on TV. The Clinton campaign could have some opportunities in Spanish language media that would be less expensive, obviously, than English language media that, that they could potentially try to exploit if they wanted to. But at this point, you know, that's really the question. The Sanders campaign has been putting, they put one of their best organizers on the ground a staffer had been working in some of the early states. For them, it's a question of whether or not it was too little too late. How does she get between now and California in this window here? How does she create good news days for her? I think she's got to continue to do what she is strongest at, which is to be a policy one, to give us her ideas as much as people may reject it. If people don't come around to it, I think Donnie's right. We're going to have a real problem in the campaign. Oh, but I give, think at some po point, give policy addresses. Well, I think I don't think it would hurt for her to give a, a serious policy address around economic growth and income inequality and the things she plans to do. Oh, the problem like the president is, at a community and, and, college and, and one of the areas where we have to get I a big agree turnout. With you, and I, and but maybe what, if we get two weeks before the election, unfortunately, in these news cycles. We're not going to start the top of the show that way. And that's the problem. Where she lives and where her strong suit is is not where the media lives and, more importantly, is not where voters want to be. By, by the way, everything Bernie Sanders is saying does not make sense. Free college does not make sense. It doesn't matter. People want to hear it. There's rage. And I, I don't know what I would do with Hillary at this point, right? Well, if, if Donald Trump is making the case, I didn't mean to cut the case, but Donald Trump's making the case he will represent middle class interests more, then perhaps you give speeches where you contrast what he's done in the middle class in terms of people who have worked for him over the years and what she's done uh, in public policy spaces. I think there's a way to do it. I think there's a way to exploit her strength around wonkishness, uh, and she's got to figure it out. And I would agree with you to this point. She's not figured that out yet. I mean, we, for all the problems Donald Trump or uh, Hillary Clinton has with her image, Donald Trump has a huge image problem. I mean, how do you I'll tell you the difference rebrand is, him if you're Re Donnie Deutsch? Her big, or I talked <laughs> about this earlier. His big issue is temperament. But he's still, you can move temperament, just like he did today. Oh, wow, a very kind of intelligent Republican list. Her issues of non-trust and kind of establishment, you can't move either of those. You sound a lot like Paul Manafort to me. No, but I'm just, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a marketing guy. I'm just telling you, forget who I like and don't like. I can move Trump in the public consciousness easily. She's too baked in, and that's the problem. There's a lot more to play with. The culture in, the, in this campaign is the same as the Obama culture was. David Plouffe would always say, don't watch cable news, don't read political websites. Are they genuinely worried? I know from my reporting that some of them are, but day to day, the people you're dealing with, are they worried about this phase or do they think it's overblown? About this phase vis a vis Bernie Sanders? Yeah, or? well, both. Sanders is fighting the two front war, uh, the notion that she's got to continue to go to the convention while Trump seems to be in, in some ways unifying the Republicans. I would say that there is a general wariness on the part of some corners of the Clinton camp about how this plays out between now and July. And I think the question really is, how long does this last? I think everyone is resigned to this idea that Bernie Sanders is going to go through June 7th, June 14th, really, with, when D.C. votes, and then make a decision. I think the question is, what does Bernie Sanders do to land the plane, if anything? And that is a wild card that is enough still to give people pause in the Clinton campaign. One word. Debates. She's got to get to the debates. I, I think Look, more than any other election, that's where there's going to be. This is also. still, but Donnie, think about this. Four weeks ago, we were all sitting around saying there's going to be, could be an open or five weeks, whatever the number is. There's going to be an open, fractured, fragmented uh, convention for Republicans. The Democrats are going to sort up. Here we are five weeks ago, a different conversation. Come June 15th, June 20th, right. we could have, be having a very different conversation as well, So, which is why I think you have to put her in her strength lane, which is issues and wonkishness. Right. All right, Hunt and Harold, or as we sometimes call it, Harold and Hunt. It's <laughs> a new show coming Harold and Hunt. I like Thank that. you both. <laughs> Coming up, Donald Trump's relationship with Rupert Murdoch and Fox News. We'll talk to Gabe Sherman from New York Magazine right after this. And if you're watching us in Washington, D.C., you can now listen to us on the radio radio at Bloomberg 99.1 FM. Be right back. So when you look back, on the, on the past nine months from that first debate to now. Any regrets? Uh, absolutely, I have regrets. But overall, I, you know, I have to be very happy with the outcome. And I think if I didn't conduct myself in the way I've done it, I don't think I would have been successful, actually. When I'm wounded, I go after people hard, okay? And I try and unwound myself. Now, you're steps away from the presidency. Have you given any thought in this position to the power that your messaging has? I have. I have. And 
I see suffering. I mean, I see tremendous suffering, and I understand it. I have a very big heart. That was a fun-sized bite of Donald J. Trump billionaire's interview with Megyn Kelly that aired on Fox broadcast channel last night. Here to talk to us about Donald Trump's once fraught and now pretty chummy relationship with both Fox News and Rupert Murdoch and his empire, the national affairs editor, the author, Gabe Sherman of New York Magazine. Gabe, thanks for thanks, coming in. Thanks for so you have another great piece inside Fox talking about why Rupert Murdoch has dropped what he had expressed for a long time on Twitter and elsewhere about reservations mm -hmm. about Trump. Why has he now basically thrown in with Trump? Business. I mean, Trump is the Republican nominee and he has to get on board. I mean, Fox News, the audience of Fox, you know, during this whole feud with Trump, the audience was totally on Trump's side. I mean, it was really only a select group of Fox anchors, mainly in Washington, who was part of this sort of anti-Trump crowd, and they were on the opposite side. Anchors you know, and commentators, commentators like Charles Carter. Yeah, yeah, and Rich Lowry. And, yeah. But now that Trump is the nominee, the network has to get behind him because that's what the audience wants. Is it true that the numbers, whenever that Fox would do an anti-Trump segment, the numbers would actually Yes, the, the producers would see, you know, on the, five, the dial segment, the, the numbers would come down. You know, during the feud with Megyn Kelly, all of the emails and the tweets and the social media response that Fox producers were getting were taking Trump's side. And, and I reported this earlier, Megyn Kelly was worried about the volume of emails and the death threat she was getting for challenging Trump. So this was a case where Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes decided, this is what the base, this is what our audience wants. Let me, let me challenge for a second. Interestingly enough, obviously politically, he lines up more with Trump. But Fox News would do better over the next four years with Hillary in there because mm -hmm. then they are the guys, you know, uh, throwing the stones. You always, they always do sure. better. Uh, so sure. obviously, for a long-term play, one could argue for viewership, mm -hmm. be better with Hillary in there. Well, really, I mean, and that's a good point. I think it's a win-win, as, as I write. You know, Rupert gets behind. Trump in the in the general. If Trump wins, he has a line into the administration, like, like they do with George W. Bush. And if he loses, you know, Fox is the ready-made opposition. The audience is already galvanized to, to oppose Hillary. So I think it's a win-win for all sides. So the New York Post, also Murdoch property, is on board. Yeah. Why do Paul Chigo and the Wall Street Journal editorial board, why do they get to be independent? How did, does that fly in the face of the notion That's that a Rupert great basically point. says, my empire marches in one direction? Great point. You know, when he bought the Wall Street Journal, he did say that they would have some more of an independent special relationship. He has honored that. And that's a great, you know, I wonder, and I should do some reporting on that, what are those internal conversations like at the Wall Street Journal editorial board? Because when the rest of the Murdoch uh, constellation is getting behind Trump, how can they stand so, alone? I know you haven't reported this yet, although I suspect you will if it's there. It seems to me when Trump is doing these hardball negotiations with Ailes and with Murdoch, yeah. he should say to them, I hate the Wall Street Journal, fix that, yeah. or I'm not doing this, Megyn Kelly. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great negotiating point. You know, in my sit down with Trump uh, in March, he was ranting about a Wall Street Journal editorial. I mean, the op-ed page to him him is, you know, his bet noir. He wants to bring them to heel. That would be an amazing victory for him. If, if, he could I, bring if I were Trump, if these, if these negotiations really go the way they seem to, yeah. I'd say, I'm not doing any more Fox until you guys fix the journal. Well, maybe he's watching. <laughs> My suggestion, Mr. Trump. Is there any, if you're a independent, is there any negative for Trump that Murdoch is upon? Okay, now this is the machine. Oh, boy, you talked about stuff being rigged. Well, now it's starting to get rigged. You've got the media empire behind you. Mm -hmm. You've got another titan behind you. You've got his, it, is it counterintuitive to his message about saving the little guy from the rig system? I think so. Or is that too I, inside baseball? I think it's too inside baseball. I think his audience is the Fox audience, and the, they want to see Fox cheerleading for him. You know, one point I think that hasn't gotten a lot of talk is last night was a bad night for Megyn Kelly. You know, she had staked out her uh, brand, her public image, nice as, as the lone Fox anchor who would stand up to Trump in a kind of vocal way. And by caving to him, she has ceded all of that authority that she had built up. I couldn't agree with you and, more. But couldn't you get it back just on her show by going after him a little bit? I don't think so. No, I mean, it was such I a capitulation. I think she had, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah. She had such a great place yeah. as a woman, yeah. as the lone wolf, exactly. as the anti-Trump. She could have written her own ticket. Certainly I think a step back. she lost yeah. some of the testosterone. Gabe, out of her got to go, man. Okay. Thank, thank you. you, Gabe Sherman, New York Magazine. Thank you as always. Awesome. Thanks for being here. We'll be right back. Donnie Doy, say briefly to all the people on Twitter who think we're overstating Hillary Clinton's problems why they're wrong. They're very, very wrong. The only thing that Hillary Clinton needs a Barry Goldwater moment to just scare the bejesus because other than that, this thing's moving the Trump direction. A lot of time left, but I'd be scared. Yeah, there's scared. a lot of time left, but man, there's not a great moment for no. her. BloombergPolitics.com has some great stories, though. Right now on Donald Trump's SCOTUS picks, his financial disclosure, 
and that Facebook meeting today with conservatives. Coming up on Bloomberg TV, Corey Johnson speaks to Google's head of virtual reality. That's on Bloomberg West. Big thanks to Donnie Deutsch. We'll be back here tomorrow. Thanks for watching. Sayonara. Fisting. Only my fist. Only my fist. I got a fist.